Welcome back to another session of easy explanatory video on idiopathic hypertropic pyloric stenosis. These are the topics we will dealing in this video today. We must have a basic information about the anatomy of stomach. Those who want to skip kindly start with the definition part of video. So, here is our stomach, which is in continuation with esophagus above, from where it receives the food. It is connected below with duodenum, via which the food leaves the stomach and reaches various parts of intestine for further modification. The stomach can be divided into cardia, fundus, body and pylorus, which is our main area of discussion here. Pyloric antrum is the first part connected to body of stomach. Then comes the pyloric canal, which is separated from duodenum via a pyloric sphincter, which closes and opens to allow the food to pass. If we look under the surface, the pylorus is made up of various muscles. They are outer longitudinal, inner circular and inner longitudinal. These are the muscles that hypertrophy to cause stenosis of pyloric canal. Let's start with our main topic, infantile hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. The terms themselves describe what it is. Infantile implies that it is basically a disease of infancy, as the average age when symptom begins is three weeks. But it can start anywhere between one week of age to up to five months. Similarly, the term hypertrophic because main problem is the hypertrophy and hyperplasia of muscles of pylorus. So the normal muscles allow the food to pass, but once hypertrophied, the passage out of pylorus is narrowed or stenosed, leading to functional gastric outlet obstruction. Let's look at the epidemiology of pyloric stenosis. It is seen more commonly in whites than blacks and is rare in Asians. Males are affected more, especially the firstborn males. That's a very important question asked in exams. It is seen more commonly if the mother had pyloric stenosis. Some associations with blood groups, B and O, have been noticed. The exact cause is not known. Use of erythromycin in the first two weeks of life has been suggested and therefore, erythromycin is avoided in newborns. Also suggested a use of macrolide antibiotics in mother during pregnancy or breastfeeding. It may be associated with other congenital anomalies like tracheoesophageal fistula and few other syndromes. Not using erythromycin in first two weeks is a high yield question. Features that should arise suspicion include. An infant of approximately three weeks of age, who is not gaining weight adequately, is always hungry, feeds vigorously, and vomits following few or almost all feeds, depending upon the severity. As the baby feeds, food or milk begins to accumulate in the stomach as the passage out of the stomach is narrowed. Gradually, as the pressure in the stomach rises to more than the lower esophageal pressure, the lower esophageal sphincter opens and feed is vomited. As the stomach is nearly empty again and baby is not nourished enough, baby feels hungry and begins to cry for feed. This cycle continues and despite taking multiple feed, baby will not gain weight adequately. Remember, since the site of obstruction is before duodenum, vomitus will be non-bilious. Due to increased pressure, it may be projectile. As the site for fluid and feed loss is from stomach, it will also lead to loss of hydrochloric acid or HCl loss of hydrogen and chloride ions, causes hypochloremic hypokalemic metabolic alkalosis. These are very frequently asked questions at all levels. An abdominal moving mass can be seen when the baby feeds. Hence in hospital setting it is useful to give the baby a test feed and watch. As the stomach tries to push the feed through stenosed passage, a peristaltic wave can be seen. The wave is seen from left upper abdomen crossing to right. This makes the diagnosis quite clear. Another important clinical tool is palpation of mass in abdomen. This mass is formed due to hypertrophy pylorus, which can be appreciated by superficial palpation. Mass ranges from firm to hard, is mobile, olive shape, approximately 2 cm long, best palpated from left side, and is located above and to the right of umbilicus in the epigastrium. Best time to palpate is following an episode of vomiting. Another less commonly remembered clinical association is icteropyloric syndrome. As the name suggests there is icterus or hyperbilirubinemia in a child of pyloric stenosis. It is the most common clinical association. Jaundice is of unconjugated type. The exact cause is not known but is thought to be due to decrease or mutation in enzymes needed for conjugation. Jaundice results with surgery. Diagnosis can easily be made clinically, with typical history, palpation of olive-shaped mass, visibility of peristalsis and blood gas abnormality and confirmed with imaging. Let's see what imaging modalities are needed. A thickened and elongated pylorus is visualized on ultrasound. There are three criteria for diagnosis. The length of pylorus should be greater than 15 to 19 millimeters. 
the pyloric diameter is greater than 10 to 14 millimeters. And the thickness of pylorus is greater than 3 to 4 millimeters. This criteria has a sensitivity of 95%. Other signs that can be seen on USG include donut sign or target sign. This can be seen by placing the transducer to give a longitudinal view. The outer ring of donut is formed by thickened muscle and inner circle is formed by collapsed mucosa. Thus, it resembles a donut and a target. Other lesser popular signs are nipple sign, where the collapsed mucosa projects into the proximal antrum and resemble a nipple. This view also resembles a female cervix and, hence, this sign is called cervix sign. On contrast imaging, when a feed with contrast is given, it forms a thin string-like line when it passes through the narrowed area. On reaching duodenum, it spreads outwards on both sides like this. This string-like thin line gives us the string sign on contrast. This string shape is compressed on both sides by thickened pyloric muscle, which appears like two tracks around the string. This is known as double track sign. The contrast here resembles a mushroom, the top part of mushroom, being the flared part where contrast enters duodenum and spreads. And the stem of mushroom being the double track or the compressed area inside the pylorus. This is called, therefore, called the mushroom sign. The part before the fluid enters the stenosed part of pylorus resembles the shoulders, due to bulging of hypertrophied pylorus into proximal antrum. Hence, it is termed shoulder sign. The most commonly asked, among these in exams, are the USG criteria, which are mentioned as a part of MCQ, and the donut or target sign. Coming to treatment. Of course, we always have to start with ABC or airway, breathing and circulation. Patient is usually dehydrated with electrolyte abnormalities so that has to be corrected as per guideline. Definitive management is always surgical. The surgery is called pyloromyotomy or classically called Ramsted pyloromyotomy, which involves cutting through the muscle layers of pylorus. In short, it's done via an incision in right upper abdomen. The hypertrophy pylorus is identified and the muscle layers are dissected up to the mucosa. This allows for easier passage for the food and increased pyloric diameter. If due to any condition surgery cannot be carried out, then patient is managed conservatively. The methods include feeding via nasoduodenal route, so as to skip the hypertrophied part. Atropine can be administered via oral or intravenous route, causes pyloric muscle relaxation. But remember, these can provide complete relief. Hence, the main treatment modality is surgery, following the stabilization of patient. Before ending, let's revise the important points. An infant of approximately three weeks of age, not gaining adequate weight, would present with complain of vomiting after feeds. On further inquiry, mother will tell you that the child is always hungry and crying and is eager to feed. But vomits after most feeds. Vomitus may be projectile and is non-bilious. On examination, you will notice a dehydrated child with inadequate weight gain. A test feed is given. Visible peristalsis may be seen and an olive-shaped mass palpated. On blood gas examination, hypochloremic hypokalemic metabolic alkalosis is seen. On USG, look for criteria and important signs like donut sign. Patient is stabilized with correction of dehydration and electrolyte abnormalities and referred for surgery, classically a Ramsted pyloromyotomy. That's it for this topic. Hope this video was of some help. Don't forget to check out another videos.